we sing there is only love in my church too and I always cry and then I have to get up and talk <laughs> and I've tried to explain to them why that song and I'll say but it's it's Michael God and we used to be in Dallas and it would be I don't I don't know if they get it uh, but he was at CSL and I was at Unity and people who got mad at one church would come to the other for a while and so there was a lot of back and forth I was also there when he recorded live at the mansion he's, he's told you he used to play in bars right okay so here's a question are any of you going through any kind of change or transition in your life right now or maybe you just know someone who is you have probably heard that when one door closes another one opens and it can be hell in the hallway you're in the hallway when something has changed. You know your life will never be quite the same again, but you don't know what's coming next. Does that sound familiar at all? Okay. I first talked about the hallway years ago, and I was astounded at the reaction. Uh, people were so grateful just to have a name for it. They would come up and say, now I know what I've been going through. And they were also uh, very reassured to know that there is light at the door. So if you think about the transitions of your life as a hallway, it falls naturally into three parts. What put you in the hallway, what do you do while you're there, and how do you get out? But notice that getting out is not the first thing to work on. <laughs> See, you already got it. A lot of bad decisions can be made in a panic to feel better. But let's come back to that. What puts you in the hallway? It could be the death of a loved one. Adjusting to life after loss is a hallway. Divorce, losing a job, going bankrupt. Becoming a caregiver leads you into the unknown. Sometimes a door slams suddenly. You get a phone call with terrible news or a scary diagnosis and everything has changed. Sometimes the door creaks shut slowly. You know your child will be leaving home or you're planning to retire. When you know it's coming, there's a hallway on the way to the event and then a hallway of adjustment afterwards. <laughs> Some hallways are chosen. Uh, anytime you change jobs or move to a new city, you're in a place of uncertainty and that can be uncomfortable even though you chose it. I chose the hallway when I left my job as a reporter to go to ministerial school with Mindy Lawrence. Uh, and I was terrified while I was in school, even though I knew it was my path. That was a long period of uncertainty. Some hallways are entirely within you. In unity, we call this divine restlessness. It's just you know there's something more. Something's got to give. You just don't know what yet. You're actually being called higher spiritually, but it can feel like wandering in the wilderness. Entire groups can go through hallways together, an office staff waiting to see who gets laid off or who the new boss is, cities where there's been a mass shooting or a natural disaster. I live in Wimberley, and you may remember we had a devastating flood on Memorial Day weekend in 2015. Homes were destroyed, two families were swept away, and life in our town changed for all of us together, a group hallway to see what would happen next. One couple in my church spent a year rebuilding their house, and another couple is not back home yet. And then there's a type of hallway I didn't realize until people started telling me I was leaving one out. Call it the endless hallway. I hear about it from families where someone is mentally ill, or maybe a child has Down syndrome. Caregiving itself is a long hallway, but for most people, it will eventually end, sadly. For some, however, it's endless. The situation won't ever change or get better in their lifetimes. The only door to be opened is within, to find peace and acceptance. And it's, it's sad, isn't it? There are so many stories and so much loss in a lifetime. So I encourage you to feel whatever you feel in the hallway. You can feel it now or dredge it up in therapy 10 years from now. 
And yes, it hurts. And yes, your life might never be the same. And no, you don't know what the future hold, holds. But try to lean into the pain. I know that's easier said than done. But people who move through a hallway successfully move through pain. There's really no way around it. You become willing to be uncomfortable in the interest of your own spiritual growth. It's tempting, though, just to look for the first doorway out. I said we'd come back to this, that trying to get out of the hallway is not the first thing to work on. So let me tell you a story. I worked at Unity of Dallas with a minister named John Webster. Tall, white hair, handsome. He handled most of the pastoral care. So he counseled with people, he visited the sick, he prayed with people on the phone. And John was about 80 when he wrote his hallway story for me. I still have the original on notebook paper in his block printing. It starts long before he was a minister, with the death of his first wife, two days before his 40th birthday. He had two girls at home and a job in the insurance industry that required him to travel all the time. That was an uncomfortable hallway. So what did he do? He got married again as soon as he could. Someone to cook and clean and take care of the children. He realized years later what he really wanted was a housekeeper. And <laughs> and he realized that's how he treated her. So that marriage lasted a year. He tried again. That marriage lasted eight years, I think. During that time, he felt he did a lot of damage to his relationship with his younger daughter, who was still at home. And then he started learning about spiritual principles through unity. And he was able to start changing his life from the inside out, which is what we do. So he married one more time, happily. He healed his relationship with his daughter, eventually. And he served and taught and uplifted people until his death a few years ago. John learned there's no quick way out of the hallway. And the discomfort can be intense. There's a spiritual author I like named Mirabai Starr. Her 14-year-old daughter was killed in a car accident. And Mirabai called her hallway a time of radical unknowingness. But she vowed to her daughter who died, I will honor you by not turning away from this fire of grief this fire of grief. Every hallway includes some grief. Something has been lost. So feel whatever you feel, and remember to let other people support you. We will all be in a hallway at times. We can support each other. So you're in the hallway. Now what do you do? The early hallway is a terribly vulnerable time, not only because your life has changed, but because it's so easy to beat yourself up. Why didn't I see this coming? Why didn't I take better care of my health? Why wasn't I more careful with money? And sometimes, how could God let this happen? You see how we create our own hell in the hallway with our thoughts? It doesn't have to be hell, of course. It can be a time of visioning infinite possibilities. But that might not be your first reaction. And it's important to know that the spiritual work of the hallway does not depend on the circumstances that put you there. Certainly, death is different from divorce, is different from job loss. And over time, you'll address the specifics of your situation, like looking for a new job. But the spiritual work is the same, no matter the circumstances. Spiritual principles are simple, but not easy. No matter how long you've been a student of truth, no matter how long you've been on a spiritual path, the question is, how's your life working? I don't believe there are advanced spiritual laws. The advanced curriculum is provided by your own life when you apply the same basic principles to new and different situations. And in the hallway, that starts with acceptance. You see that a door has closed and latched, and so you turn around and say, okay, I am in the hallway now. My life has changed. That means I have to change. 
So here's my gentle suggestion to help you with acceptance in the hallway. Just consider that this is not happening to you, it's happening for you. What shows up in your life is there for a reason, and somehow it's for your highest good, your soul's growth. And so for me, knowing that it's happening for me shifts the question. Okay, if this is for me, then where is the good? What gifts is this bringing? And you'll see good in small ways at first. Maybe friends will check on you. You feel love from other people. Maybe the depth of your own prayers increases. And that good won't stop. Everything that happens in your life brings gifts and answers your soul's deepest desires. Every life event is an opportunity to connect more closely with God. A woman named Brenda is one of actually several people I know who've been through cancer and who says, I wouldn't wish it on anyone, but I wouldn't have missed the spiritual growth it brought me. She says for a long time after she was diagnosed with it was breast cancer, she was stuck in why me? She already believed we're the creators of our reality, so why would she have created this? And she was about four weeks into chemo when she says she woke up one morning and realized if I'm going to heal this, I have to take responsibility for creating it. Now listen, that doesn't mean she wanted cancer. It doesn't mean she sat around thinking about cancer until she got it. It also doesn't mean she quit her treatments to meditate and affirm herself well. It was about becoming a co-creator with God, consciously drawing on the one presence and power within her to change what she could. So she would ask herself, am I really being positive? Am I really taking care of myself? Am I listening to messages from my body? She put her spiritual tools to work. She released the outcome and focused on each day, just making a point to appreciate every moment. If she could get from the bed to the sofa that day, she was grateful. She also began to feel compassion for every person she met. Brenda got well, but even if she hadn't, living in appreciation and compassion is pretty much the highest spiritual plane we can reach. It's the healing of a life. I was surprised how many people told me about going through physical illness, saying they had to take responsibility for getting well, for creating their own health. And you notice how Brenda said she let go of the outcome? Acceptance leads to surrender. Our pain is in the resistance. It's in saying, this is not how things should be. For me, surrender means giving up the stubborn belief that life should be fair or make sense in any given moment. I don't believe you have to hit bottom to surrender. Surrender is feeling a sense of peace and trusting that all is well, no matter how things turn out. And you can choose to believe that any time, over and over if necessary. So acceptance, this is the way things are now. And surrender, all is well, even if I can't see it. There is good here for me. Another spiritual tool to use in the hallway is forgiveness. No matter what put you in the hallway, there's probably someone to forgive. The spouse who walked out, the boss who fired you, maybe a doctor missed an early diagnosis, the parent who needed so much care at the end. The Greek word for forgive means to untie the knot. We have to untangle ourselves from the past before we can move forward. And you know, forgiving does not condone the act. There's a story in the book about a woman who forgave the man who raped her, a stranger. It was not okay for him to do what he did, and she's glad he's in prison. But she also knew it was not okay for her to hate. And she didn't want one sick man and one event in her life to control her entire future. So gradually, over time, she forgave him. She didn't even realize she'd forgiven until one day she took some teddy bears to the rape crisis center and she didn't feel anything. She was free. Forgiveness 
frees you. Then, of course, prayer is a crucial part of the hallway. One man was in a coma for nearly two months and said later he could feel the prayers for him, and he described it like a bottlenose dolphin might nudge a drowning man toward the surface of the water. I love that description. So I can offer you two prayers for your work in the hallway, and I'll warn you they are powerful. The first one is, reveal what needs to be revealed and heal what needs to be healed. You could spend your whole life working on what comes out of that. <laughs> reveal what needs to be revealed and heal what needs to be healed. And then the other one is, lead me where you need me and speak to me in ways I cannot possibly misunderstand. <laughs> and then watch what happens. If your life is like mine, you will end up in unexpected places doing things you never thought you could. So see, your time in the hallway is not wasted. Use it for your growth and learning. It can become a pivot point in your life. But what everyone wants to know, how do you get out? Well, first let me ask you, are you sure you want out? Because the hallway can become really comfortable. Some people install carpet and air conditioning. <laughs> Because think about it, you might be getting lots of sympathy and attention there. You might be stuck in telling your story, it's become your identity. You might feel guilty about moving on. My friend Judith said after her husband died, what if I get to the end of the hallway and forget him? She was afraid that creating a new life for herself would mean losing him. It didn't. Leaving the hallway also requires some decisions like answering the question, what do you want? Because you are the creator of your experience and you get to design your life, always. This doesn't mean your life will ever be quite the same as it was. And I'm not saying you should forget about what happened and go blithely on. There's a grief counselor named Megan Devine who says some things in life cannot be fixed. They can only be carried. But your life will go on and you will create what happens next. You can't not create with your thoughts. That's the law. So you might as well do it deliberately. So here's what I know for sure about leaving the hallway. Consciousness shifts first. And by consciousness, I mean your thoughts, feelings, and beliefs. You may be aware of them or not, but they rise to a new level. They expand into greater awareness. You might not see a change in your circumstances yet, but life starts to feel different. You notice you're looking forward more often than back. And you start to ask yourself, what do I want? This is where we get to pull out all the fun spiritual tools. You can write your vision for the next few years. You can imagine a new life, set your intentions, and let the universe worry about how to bring it about. When I coach people, it's mostly about how to get out of the hallway, how to design a life you would love from now on. And I'm very aware that I'm saying you can create a life you love after I just told you to surrender and let go of the outcome. It's both and. The spiritual path is full of paradoxes. Our job is to create the conditions for an abundant life, and it's exactly like preparing a garden and planting seeds. We are not in control of how the sun and soil and rain combine to bring those seeds out of the ground and turn them into flowers or vegetables. But we create the conditions for that flowering, and we decide which seeds to plant. Joseph Campbell said, when you follow your bliss, doors will open where you would not have thought there would be doors and where there wouldn't be a door for anyone else. That's the power of your intention. Ideas and money will materialize. Exactly the right people will show up to guide you. Doors will open most of the time. But there's a whole chapter in the book called Why Isn't It Working? One woman said, what if you try to follow your bliss and your bliss doesn't want you? Isn't that sad? 
So you probably can expect delays in the hallway. Sometimes everything falls into place so fast your head spins. But if there are delays, know that delays can be a form of guidance. Sometimes a delay gives you time to realize you're asking for the wrong things. There's something else you really want. Or maybe a delay is necessary to line up the people and circumstances you need. And delays can be caused by the blocks in us. The thoughts and beliefs that hold our good at bay. Blocks like fear and unworthiness. So don't worry if the process is slow. Consciousness has to shift first. Inner change precedes outer change. That's why we do all this spiritual work in the hallway. So we can open the next door onto what we truly want. My friend Judith, who was afraid that leaving her husband, leaving her hallway, would mean forgetting her husband. She finally went through all the sad and lonely feelings she'd been trying to avoid. And she let the universe know what she really wanted. She wanted a new man in her life. Who cares that she was 75? And one day, a guy she'd known in high school called and said he was going to be in the area. Maybe they could visit. They had dated a little bit back in high school. They went to the junior prom together. Turned out he'd never forgotten her. He was not going to be in the area. He was coming to the area, <laughs> hoping to see her. She didn't know that till later. But I performed their wedding on their back porch two years ago. And when they sent out the invitations, it had a black and white picture of the two of them as teenagers, all dressed up for their junior prom 59 years earlier. Sometimes you experience delays. <laughs> while the pieces are moved into place. <laughs> so the hallway's a busy time in your life. It might start with panic, blame, shame, anger, fear, but eventually comes acceptance, this is where I am now, and surrender. This must be happening for me, so I'll look for the good. I know God is in every situation. Then use your spiritual practices, forgiveness, prayer. Let others pray for you. You can borrow their faith. And when you're ready to move forward, invoke the spiritual laws you know. You will live either by design or default. It's worth it to stay awake, to pay attention, to use all the spiritual tools at your disposal to create the life you want. Knowing that there may be delays or surprises, and even those have a divine purpose. There are no victims, only volunteers. Our souls volunteered for spiritual growth in this human lifetime. Our hallways are opportunities for that growth. Just remember one basic principle. God is in every circumstance. Good is in every circumstance. And your good is waiting behind the next door.